go from there. Um, all right, uh, welcome everyone to uh, the third and final day of the Quantum Limits of Knowledge 2021. Um, this morning we have uh, Gerard Milburn talking to us about quantum agents and the thermodynamics of machine learning. Um, all right, and since we've got a few minutes ahead, uh, do you want to take it from there? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Richard. So first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to join the meeting. It's been fascinating so far, lots of very interesting talks. Um, it's 5 p.m. in the afternoon of Wednesday here, so I'm looking forward to another night of really interesting talks. And uh, uh, it's just a pity that I can't get to meet all my friends in person there, but this is better than nothing. Okay, so I'm going to talk about quantum agents and the thermodynamic of machine learning. Uh, this is work funded jointly by the Center for Engineered Quantum Systems at the University of Queensland and uh, FQXI, or at least part of it's funded by FQXI. My collaborators are there at the bottom, Sally Shrapnel. Uh, she has expertise in machine learning, particularly in the medical area, but as, as well as interests in foundations of physics and philosophy. Michael Cuming is a postdoc with Sally, uh, and Pete Evans is my go-to philosopher at the University of Queensland. And I will come to some uh, philosophical issues, or at least try to, uh, talk about some, philosoph some philosophical issues towards the end. Okay, so here's an outline of my talk. I want to talk about the thermodynamics of a causal agent, and uh, this is the setting in which I want to give the talk, talking about causation, uh, with a focus on the thermodynamics of sensors and actuators, then more particularly on machine learning and the thermodynamics of machine learning, in particular, how quantum clocks can be used for spike processing in machine learning. Uh, then just uh, finish up with a quick discussion of uh, a novel, a uniquely quantum kind of control based on coherent control and some philosophical speculations. Okay, so cause in physics is a really old problem. I could have given the famous quote by Russell explaining to us all how cause is useless in physics, but this is a much earlier one from Mark who said, there is no cause nor effect in nature. Nature has but an individual existence. Nature simply is. And it's his, in his wonderful book, The Science of Mechanics. And of course, what he's referring to is that uh, Newton's equations are deterministic. And if you're given the positions of velocity at one time, you can predict the, pos pos the positions and, or determine at least the positions and velocities at any time into the past and into the future. But there are other views and more particularly associated with so-called manipulability theories of intervention or interventions uh, in, 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 in a computer science sense. So uh, Judea Pearl is the person uh, who's most advanced this cause. And it's basically tries to distinguish correlations from causation. So correlation does not imply causation. And he says a world devoid of the probability of M, uh, L, some, some event, given that we do something in the world, um, and our world is governed by that, but not governed by a con simply just a conditional probability. So he makes a distinction between conditional probabilities and these active interventions. I won't go into any details on that. Um, his book is uh, widely available and I'm sure you can check it out there. But then there's another view from philosophers who point out that really causation is, an, is uh, something associated with agency and Hugh Price, a philosopher, at uh, Cambridge until recently pointed out that a distinctive mix of knowledge, ignorance and practical ability that a creature must apparently exemplify if it is to be capable of employing causal concepts. So that's his idea of causation. So let me nail my colors to the mask. For me, a causal agent is an open dissipative system driven into non-thermal equilibrium steady states by access to a low entropy source of energy. And I'll make connections to those other definitions as I go along. So here's a little picture. Uh, we have a causal agent, which is contained within some boundary. Uh, it's interacting with the world. It's an open system. It's driven from equilibrium by some sort of power supply, which powers both a learning machine, actuators and sensors. Actuators uh, are, are maintained in some non-equilibrium steady state. And every now and then they do work on the world. So their free energy is decreased and the world does work on sensors which are also maintained in some non-equilibrium quiescent state. Uh, these uh, devices can then store 
their actions or sensations in memory, or they can act directly on the learning machine. And the objective of the learning machine is to establish relationships between the correlations inherent in actuator and sensor data. I stress that this is an open system driven far from equilibrium, so it necessarily produces heat during operation. So three key points, agents are always embedded in an entropic gradient because of the assumption of their openness. Actuators do work on the world and work does work on sensors. So there's a fundamental asymmetry there, a thermodynamic asymmetry between actuators and sensors. And something that has to be looked at very carefully and that is all learning machines, uh, open dissipative systems maintain far from thermal equilibrium. So for people who have a background in machine learning, it may seem a little odd to talk about the thermodynamics of an algorithm, but in actual fact, all our deep learning uh, algorithms essentially derived from attempts to model physical processes in the brain. So they are attempting to simulate open systems. And in any case, training them consumes vast amounts of energy. So let me focus on some quantum sensors and actuators to give you an idea of how this works. So here we have a very simple system. The agent is going to send out single photon Fox states. That's about as low as you can go when it comes to doing work. Uh, and it will receive back single photon Fox states. The world I'm going to consider is really simple. It's just a single sided cavity with a line width and some detuning from the carry frequency of the single photons. Uh, each of the sensors and actuators is based on a Raman system. So let me focus on, on the uh, sensor, which is actually a single photon source. The way it works is the agent supplies a classical control field E of T, which then makes a Raman transition to the excited state, assuming it's with high probability in the ground state to begin with. And that photon is emitted into the cavity and the cavity is assumed to be lossy. So it comes straight out the end and off to the world. The, uh, the sensors, the time reverse of that, uh, we just um, start now with the atoms or as, as many as we can get into the excited state. And we can use another uh, pulse, cl uh, classical pulse to transfer a single photon that enters the cavity into the ground state. And then our records will be, is the sensor in the excited state or is the actuator, uh, sorry, is the, uh, is, the, is the sensor in the ground state and is the actuator in the excited state at the end of these intermittent processes. Uh, now, clearly you need some source of driving to initialize the states of the sensor and the actuator to make sure that in the case of the actuator, uh, it's predominantly in the ground state. In the case of the sensor, it's predominantly in the excited state. And so they're not in thermal equilibrium. So there'd be no point in having these sources in thermal equilibrium with the world. So because it's a single-sided cavity, it uh, implements a unitary transformation. And it simply changes the pulse shape of the single photon, which comes back to the sensor. And if I can now choose the control field for the sensor to exactly match the shape of the distorted single photon pulse coming back, I can transfer it with extremely high probability into the ground state. So the way this works, the way it's going to learn what the unitary transformation applied in the world is, is it runs through a little protocol where it keeps changing the, uh, the control field for the sensor until the probability to find it in the ground state is maximal. So when it's all running correctly, you see what happens is that everything it sends out comes back almost certainly. So it is not wasting energy. Uh, if it doesn't get transferred to the ground state, it's just reflected off the cavity and is lost. So this is discussed in some detail in this paper that uh, we published earlier this year. So you can simply calculate the probability to detect a single photon on return. Uh, I'll assume there's some thermal background photon number here. Uh, so the outside world is not necessarily at zero temperature. But you can see the key thing is this depends on this function gamma which is the modulus squared of an overlap integral between the shape of the single photon and the read pulse in the single photon detector. Uh, mu of sigma is just the Boltzmann factor for the effective two level transition that we're using in this Raman process. So obviously what you need to do is try and maximize uh, the probability to detect that atom in the ground state by carefully adjusting all these control fields B. Just to contrast that with the classical case, in the classical case, you could use a coherent state pulse with on average one photon, which means most of the time it has nothing and sometimes it has more than one. And not surprisingly, the probability to detect the photon is suppressed 
by this uh, probability factor here, e to the minus four gamma on kappa. Kappa, by the way, is the line width of the cavity. So how, how do you do learning? Well, what you do is you compute the error probability, the probability that you don't detect the photon, and then you have a simple little rule based on gradient descent that updates the control field for the sensor and just run it. So here's an example where I plot two things. In the top curve, I plot the difference between the true single photon pulse, uh, sorry, the true shape of the uh, pulse coming back from the outside world and my trial pulses. There are two cases plotted. The classical case is dashed and the quantum case is solid. And, and the, then there are three temperatures. So green is this Boltzmann factor, so that corresponds to zero temperature. So in the top case, you can see as I step through all the iterations of learning, the quantum case converges uh, best of all to the um, true shape of the pulse at zero temperature. And it always converges uh, to the true shape. It just takes more iterations in the presence of thermal noise. The classical case, however, performs far less well. And if you look at the error probability, you can see that why this is happening is the error probability goes to zero in the case of zero temperature and uh, using true single Fox state pulses. Every other case, it never goes to zero because of uh, the, the fact that you are probably going to detect thermal photons. So that's an example of a quantum sensor and actuator scenario where we can easily pinpoint all the uh, steps of energy work, initialization and performance and run learning. Okay, so let me now turn to the thermodynamics of machine learning. And um, some of you may be, know much more about this than I do, but let me just try and summarize it in terms of this simple parable of the sheep and the goats. The idea is to have a binary classifier for images of sheep and goats. And the way it works is we randomly stick in an image of a sheep or a goat at the beginning of it into this machine. And if it come, it, it, it will then come out in one or the other of two outputs, goat or sheep. Uh, this is really checking to see that it's predicting the correct true label of the data that has gone in. So initially, um, the sheep and goats go in at random and they come out at the, completely at random in either the goat or the sheep channel. But every time you detect an error, you feed back onto the, machining, the, uh, the uh, learning machine and change various weights and parameters in there until the error probability gets extremely small. So when it's trained, the entropy before training is basically in kT log two, but after training, if the error probability is small enough, it's vastly less than that. So it's clear that on many, 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 many trials, the entropy has been reduced, which means it has to uh, dissipate energy and produce entropy in the environment. So heat and entropy must be dissipated during training. And if anybody's looked at the cost of uh, training deep learning neural networks, you'll be certainly convinced of that. It's probably not necessary that it is so dissipated. There may be better ways to do it, but that's how it's done at the moment. Okay, so how can we trace the physics of where this heat is being dissipated? Most of these uh, type of classifiers are based on a perceptron model where we have some input, sheep or goats, or some binary representation of sheep or goats in terms of pixel values. Uh, they are then multiplied by some weights and summed and sent to an activation function, which is basically a switch that will not switch or switch depending on the strength of the incoming signal. As I'll explain in a minute, that's a highly dissipative device. It then produces a binary output Y, which is compared to the label of the data. So in the training step, all the data is labeled. So if you send in a sheep, you have to make sure that the sheep comes out at the end. If it doesn't, that's an error. Then you feed back onto the weights and adjust them all and try again. And you keep doing this uh, using some gradient descent feedback onto the probability of error until the machine almost always gets it right and correctly produces the true label. And, and, and once it's trained, you can then try it on less regulated data sets. So a physically realized activation function is a nonlinear dissipative system. And here's an example based on a biased double well with large friction, so-called Smoluchowski process. And you can see it has two states on the left and the right, and I can change the bias to move it from the left to the right. Making sure there's uh, a lot of friction ensures that when I change the bias in time, it doesn't go into oscillations and have to settle down. Here it's extremely overdamped. 
And in these two particular states, you see that um, on the left, it's most likely to be found in a steady state with the probabilities on the left. Uh, there's always some small error probability for these devices, as I'll explain in a minute, they are subject to thermal noise and have to be subject to thermal noise to work. So there's always a small chance it'll be found in the wrong way. So let's look at this. The weights control the bias of this system. So when I feed back onto this, I'm going to be changing the weights, which means changing the bias from left to right. So noise changes the shape of the steady state response of this device. So this is the first thing to emphasize. So if you look at the steady state response, by which I mean an ensemble average or an infinite time average, and here I've plotted the average value of the binary variable at the output from the device uh, versus the strength of the bias for differing levels of noise, where the noise is decreasing from left to right. So D is, well, it's essentially a, a thermal diffusion coefficient. And it looks like that what you might expect, well, it's really a good idea to try and get the noise as low as possible. We could, then we have this really nice sharp sigmoidal function, but that would be the wrong conclusion to draw because this is the steady state response, the infinite time response, and we don't have to, we, we can't wait around for infinity to learn something. So we need to look at the single system view and the stochastic dynamics. So this is what happens. I've simulated here three trajectories using Ito stochastic differential equations for the Smolachowski process for the binary variable, which in this case is just, is it on the left or is it on the right? It's not strictly speaking binary here, but you can see that it's either positive or negative up to noise. So the bias is being increased at a constant rate to zero from some maximum value. And these are the values of the position of the particle as a function of time. So on the far left, you see there's a lot of noise and it switches very quickly, but it's just as likely to switch back again and go backwards and forwards many, many times. I haven't put those in for simplicity. As you decrease the noise, you see, well, it takes a bit longer to switch. And if you really make the noise small, you see in a finite amount of time, it may not switch at all. Here, only one of the trajectories actually switched and the other two got stuck. So you can see it's not the right thing to do to make the noise as small as possible because then it will take an infinite amount of time to learn anything. Clearly you can't make the noise too big or you'll just get some random number generator. So there's going to have to be some trade-off between uh, how much noise there is and the time scales involved in the learning. In, in other words, there'll be a trade-off between learning rate and noise. And in this system as classical, the noise is controlled entirely by temperature. But the key point to emphasize here is that dissipation and of course noise, which is necessary by the fluctuation dissipation theorem, are essential for efficient learning machines. Uh, noise is essential. And people who do machine learning know there are all sorts of tricks based on something called dropout and so on that you can use in algorithmic machine learning protocols. So how do you train this thing? Well, the output is a random variable and the feedback to the weights is therefore stochastic. So here's one way to do it. Uh, we need to write down a stochastic differential equation for the weights or the biases acting on this simple device I just described by sampling the error probability and then implementing a, um, a gradient descent algorithm. So here you look at the change in the error probability and just using the, uh, the um, the rules of calculus, you can show that's an inner product of the change in the weights times the gradient of the error probability as a function of the weights. So you would choose that uh, always to be parallel to the gradient. And then you can see that the weight change will satisfy a stochastic differential equation. It's not obvious it's stochastic, but it is because you have to sample the error probability in finite steps in order to make this to um, function properly. So the trade-off between noise level and learning rate sorry, between noise level and uh, how fast this thing can learn will turn up in what the average learning rate is in this stochastic differential equation. Okay, so that's a very quick summary of what happens in these um, perceptron-based learning models where you just have a fixed bias and then the output either switch or doesn't, doesn't switch. It's just a binary switch. Uh, I want to emphasize that it's necessarily dissipated and it's necessarily noisy. Now, the trouble with these devices is that you don't have often, and certainly the one I've just described, a great deal of control. If you actually built this thing running classically on thermal noise, 
your only option really to change the noise is to change the temperature, or you could try and change the design of the machine to optimize it for a given temperature. But there's actually a better way to do it, and that's to use a limit cycle, because on a limit cycle or a self-sustained oscillation or relaxation os oscillation, there are various names for it, the noise is controllable. So let me now describe how that works. In particular, this is how clocks work, or periodic clocks anyway, are based on this feature. Um, so the idea is to build a perceptron using a Hopf bifurcation, which is well known in neuroscience and people modeling uh, real neurons. It's called spike pulsing processing in that case. So here's a simple clock, a pendulum. It's a driven nonlinear oscillator, and it's in a non-equilibrium steady state because work is being done on it by a falling weight, work due to gravity. The pendulum, of course, is a linear oscillator, at least it usually is set up to be a linear oscillator. But this ratchet mechanism called the anchor and wheel mechanism is basically a ratchet, is a highly non-linear device and essentially gives the pendulum a little kick uh, at, in, at particular times during its oscillation cycle. So a pendulum clock is a driven non-linear oscillator in a non-equilibrium steady state. What is that steady state? Well, in this case, it's not a fixed point, it's a limit cycle, a one-dimensional attractor. So let me give you an example of what a Oh, and I've discussed some of these things in this review paper if people want to see more details of how this works. So here are the equations of motion for the pendulum itself. X is the angular displacement, Y is the angular momentum. Gamma is the frictional damping rate and eta T is the necessary noise, which I'll neglect for the moment. And I've adiabatically eliminated the um, ratchet mechanism. So it really just provides a kick to the pendulum that's a nonlinear function of its uh, angular deviation and its momentum. And this is minus mu is the sign, is the size of the kick. This is a sign as in positive or negative. It takes about a plus one if the argument is positive and minus one if the argument is negative. And sign order is just something that depends on the design of the device. So you can quickly simulate that in the absence of noise and you find that there's a limit cycle for some sufficient value of the kicking. And here's an example of the pendulum momentum and the kicks as a function of time long after it's settled onto the limit cycle. So this doesn't start at zero time. So that's a good clock. And the clock signal is just the kick function, which is why you can hear these things going tick tock every time the little ratchet mechanism makes contact with the pendulum. Now the way the way limit cycle works is on each cycle, the work done by the drive equals the energy dissipated. So let's look at the energy of the pendulum in these dimensionless units It's just P squared plus x squared or x squared plus y squared in the symbols I'm using. So the energy decays exponentially proportional to, in this case, the kinetic energy, y squared, but the kicks are doing work on the pendulum. So the energy is being increased. It's, there's, so there's power coming in from the kicks and heat being dissipated, energy being dissipated through the friction. Uh, so that's what I just said. Now, if you integrate around, around a limit cycle, the energy is the same around the limit cycle. It, it always comes back to where it starts. So the, en the energy dissipated around the cycle will always equal the work done on the cycle. But in the presence of noise, of course, the energy dissipated and the work done will be random variables. And thus, the period of the cycle will also be a random variable. But the key point here is that the larger the limit cycle, the greater power is dissipated. Let me give an example of that. So let me move to polar coordinates for this system. Um, so now R is essentially the square root of, uh, sorry, basically the energy. Uh, it decays exponentially and it has this driving term coming from the kick function. The angle just rotates at a constant rate, slightly modified by the nonlinear nature of the kick function. So in the steady state, the limit cycle occurs when dr dt is zero. So that tells you how to get the limit cycle as a function of the strength of the driving and the damping, of course. But the larger the driving for a given, a given damping, the bigger the limit cycle. And of course, the more you drive it, the more heat has to be dissipated because the work done around the limit cycle is equal to the heat dissipated around the limit cycle. So now, now let's include noise. So this is a complicated question for these equations because they're highly nonlinear. Uh, and you have to work through the ETO change of variable rule, keeping track of the ETO corrections. But the point I wanna emphasize here is that both variables now become noisy. There's a slight modification to the fixed point due to the diffusion constant, which here is proportional to temperature. But the key point is the diffusion in phase is nonlinear 
and proportional to one over the radial variable. So if the limit cycle gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the noise in the phase gets smaller and smaller and smaller for a given temperature, which is good. So if you linearize the phase noise on a limit cycle, just replace R with the value of R on coming from the fixed point in the first equation, you can see that if I make the limit cycle big, the phase diffusion noise gets small. So in that sense, we can control the noise on the limit cycle by the design of the, uh, of the device and driving it harder. So the phase noise gets smaller, the larger the limit cycle. And this is a key feature of why we use limit cycles so often uh, for clocks. So here's three stochastic simulations of the kick function for uh, a given level of noise. And one cycle, of course, theta goes through two pi, but the time it takes to go through two pi will fluctuate from one shot, one cycle to the next. So this is really a sort of first passage time problem. And to understand how the periods fluctuate, we basically have to find the um, time it takes to reach for the phase to move through two pi. So this is a well understood problem. It's given by something called the inverse Gaussian distribution or the valve distribution. There it is. Uh, let me write down the mean and variance. So you see the mean period of this device. So T is the period in this device is two pi and omega, which is pretty much what you would expect, or omega is the frequency on the limit cycle. And the variance in the period is given by, in these units, the ratio of the noise proportional to temperature, which is sigma, divided by the size of the limit cycle. So you can see that making this limit cycle really big, driving it hard, will make it a very good clock. The, in other words, the period won't fluctuate too much. Um, and this is a general feature that's been established now for some years, in particular in this very nice paper by Erka from Huber's group in Vienna. I uh, did it for a quantum example, but it applies classically as well as quantum as I'll show. So here's a picture of that uh, inverse Gaussian where less noise is pushing to the right. And I chose the, uh, the period to be two pi. So you can see it's beginning to stack up on a period of two pi as the noise gets smaller. So that's why limit cycles are good. Now, they can also form in a quantum system. In fact, they will form in a quantum system even at zero temperature, purely, purely due to quantum noise. And this is something I really want to emphasize here. So I'm going to consider collective resonance fluorescence, which is a model in which we have a large number of atoms contained in a cavity, and they all see the same phase of the field. Um, and basically, there are these pseudo angular momentum operators that precess uh, around a sphere. The dynamics can't move off a sphere. So I'm driving it at some frequency uh, with some Rabi frequency omega, and it's being damped due to spontaneous emission. So you can write down the semi-classical equations, and you find that there's a Hopf bifurcation when the driving reaches a critical point that depends upon the number of atoms. In this system, the dissipation rate is proportional to gamma times n. This is why it's called collector resonance fluorescence. So as long as the driving is big enough, uh, you can get a fixed point bifurcation. Uh, here's the limit cycle, perhaps it would be better just to plot it, but you can see that it's confined entirely to the YZ plane because you're driving it uh, by a field in the X direction. The frequency on the limit cycle depends on how far above the threshold it is, but it's a rather nonlinear function of time. Um, so we can easily work out the quantum dynamics for this system. What I just described was purely semi-classical where I just factorize all the moments and treat it like a classical problem, essentially ignoring quantum correlations. But I can easily solve the master equation for this and about the Hopf bifurcation, you get damped oscillations. Not surprising, but not the slightest evidence of a limit cycle. So the question is, where is the limit cycle? Well, the point is you only see it if you look for it and you have to measure the right thing. You have to measure some phase dependent quantity, which in this case can be done by hemodyne detection. Here it is. I split off some of the laser and, and uh, run it through a beam splitter and mix it with the fuel coming out of the cavity, run it onto a photo detector and I get a photo current. So we, we know how to simulate these things using stochastic master equations. Basically, the idea is this, there's some classical stochastic process representing the measurement record. Every time it's updated at time dt, we have to recondition the quantum state of the source, and that changes these statistics for the next time step in the measurement record. So this is classical level sitting up here and a quantum level sitting down below, and they're tied together. So I'll quickly go through the details here. Here's the homodyne current, which I stress is a classical stochastic process. It's dependent upon the conditional mean 
of this phase dependent quantity. And generally I'll assume, I'll assume phi is zero. That's the phase of the local oscillator for homogeneous detection. And DW is the standard diffusion process, the Wiener process. How do I calculate the conditional moments? Well, for that, I need to solve the stochastic master equation, which has all the dissipative stuff coming from the unconditional equation, but now it has the stochastic term, which is highly nonlinear. If you look at it, when it acts on rho, well, this bit is linear, but this bit is nonlinear. And of course it has to be nonlinear because as you accumulate the measurement record, the possibility for the future for the future is constrained by the past because the future has to be consistent with what you've seen in the past. So these sorts of things are necessarily non-linear. By the way, this is quite similar to the uh, the sort of diffusive processes that Nicola was just saying and Percival many years ago. But here it's in the context of a very particular measurement setting where I do indeed have access to the measurement record, which is the homodyne current. Anyway. More details on that can be found in that other paper. So here's a picture where I plot the semi-classical curve as blue, nice limit cycle, JZ oscillating around like a nice clock. But there's a, a full simulation of the full quantum stochastic master equation. And you see, yes, it oscillates, not too badly, but it has phase noise. And in this case, the phase diffusion noise goes as one over the number of atoms, but the energy dissipation is proportional to the number of atoms. I stress this is all at zero temperature. This is just one spontaneous emission. And so here the energy dissipation is what Alexia has called quantum heat in some of her work, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's due to random emission from the cavity due to spontaneous emission. So it's random, it's heat in the sense that it's random energy transfers. So the limit cycle is driven by quantum noise at zero temperature only in the context of the right measurement. So you have to measure the right thing in order to see the limit cycle. Now we can turn this into a perceptron so what I'm going to do now is consider a slightly different kind of limit cycle based on a van der Poel, which is often used for spike processing. Uh, and the idea is we want to see a bifurcation go from a fixed point to a limit cycle when the signal coming in is strong enough and we need to detect the limit cycle. So a Hopf bifurcation is basically a, 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 a driven harmonic oscillator with nonlinear damping, proportional to mu. Um, these are realized in, laser, in electronic circuits and a good approximation, semi-classical approximation to the laser as well. So there's a limit cycle for the bias between plus one and minus one. The energy dissipated, you can easily calculate. Uh, it's just the rate of change, uh, uh, sorry, the integral of P squared. And if you plot the energy dissipated uh, versus uh, time, you see that if it's on a fixed point, there's some energy dissipated, but it doesn't change in time. It's just sitting there at a fixed point, dumping energy out into the world. But if it's on a limit cycle, every time you go around the limit cycle, you do a little bit of more work and you dissipate the same amount of energy. So you start moving up through these steps, which are basically just the ticks of the clock. So to make a perceptron, you just put a threshold for the power dissipated. And then when you reach that, it'll take some time, uh, you can be sure that you're on a limit cycle and not on a fixed point, because the fixed point the power is always well below the threshold. So in this system, you're basically just counting the number of steps of the clock to determine whether or not it's on the limit cycle. Now, when you're including noise, of course, life isn't so easy. So here I'm going to just consider a switch where as long as the number of steps of the clock or the number of ticks of the clock is greater than N naught, I'll switch the binary variable at the output from the perceptron. The trouble is fluctuations in the clock period will now lead to errors in the perceptron. So here's what happens if you put noise into that perceptron, just thermal noise for the moment. You see the power dissipated all over the place because the period of the clock is fluctuating and the count is not regular. So if I plotted lots of these for different uh, sample trajectories and chose a threshold in a fixed time, sometimes it'll switch and sometimes it won't. And you could say, oh, well, just, just make the time long enough, but we're back now to the trade-off between noise and the rate of learning. So we have to watch that. So here's the error probability when I say just set the number of cycles to be one. This is not probably a very good thing to do. And as you um, um, decrease the noise, you can see the error probability goes to zero roughly around a period of two pi, which is what it would be if there was no um, noise in the system. So you can build a perceptron based out of a Hopf bifurcation very easily in these systems. And there are various ways of monitoring whether or not the device has 
start to oscillate. So here's how you'd build a quantum clock perceptron. You'd uh, have a bunch of driving fields coming in, which will be then weighted in some way and then summed and hit the atoms. Then you do a hamadine detection current and check, see if it's on a limit cycle. If it is, that's good. If it isn't, you feed back and change the weights and you keep doing this over and over again, just as you would for the whole world perceptron I described earlier. So one could easily do that. And now of course it's running at zero temperature. Now it's running entirely on quantum noise. And the measurement process is a key feature of what's making it work in the first place. Now, there's no difference between measurement feedback in, uh, in, in, in classical control, all feedback is measurement feedback. In quantum control, not all feedback is measurement control. There is a unique kind of quantum control based on feedback and feed forward without measurements called coherent quantum control. Um, so this is well understood in quantum optics, is used quite a lot. You need to break, break uh, time reversal symmetry because the, 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 the device is still irreversible. And here's just a simple schematic of how you would do it using circulators, which are basically just interferometers. So they just make sure that uh, energy only flows in one direction in the case of actuators and one direction in the case of sensors. But sitting in here now, there's no measurement involved here at all. So I could run this straight into some sort of quantum processor and just have one simple measurement or flag to determine its performance. So there are relatively straightforward ways to interface um, limit cycles that arise from coherent quantum feedback and, and standard quantum computing. So here's an example. In fact, this is a ring, this is a ring cavity device. One of, one of the cavities contains a current on linearity, and this is just a high Q resonator. The fact they're ring cavities, that's equivalent to having a circulator in the system, which breaks time reversal invariance. And then you just do homodyne detection on the output. And uh, we've studied this in some detail. Indeed, you see a quantum limit cycle forming exactly as it should. Um, but now there's no measurement involved in actual the feedback. The feedback's all entirely coherent, but it's irreversible. And likewise, you can do this in superconducting circuits as well, which is what we're indeed going to do. Um, you know, other people have thought about this, in particular, Hideo Mabuchi has a device based on a fixed point perceptron, not a hop bifurcation, and he has a fully worked out protocol for all optical learning at zero temperature based on uh, uh, this kind of control cavity system. All right, so now let's just step back and try and put all this together. There's a lot of technical details there that I've raced through. Um, I'm happy to stick around and answer questions on any of it, of course, but let's just try and put all this together. What has any of this got to do with how a causal agent will work and what are the consequences? So here's a kind of simple way in which you could imagine a causal agent learning using the machines I've just described. So we have some actuator, which Axon does work on the world and keeps a record of what it's doing. And it passes a copy of that record to an emulation learning machine, something like a recurrent neural network, but realized physically. So the primary actuator record acts on the world and the sensation comes back. The purpose of the emulator is to take that actuator record and try and figure out what would be the correct sensor record corresponding to that. So it compares its prediction of the sensor record to the actual record. And if they're different, it feeds back onto the learning machine. And so you can easily show running this device will eventually lead to a very low error probability uh, in matching the, the, the intrinsic correlations between the primary actuator record and the primary sensor record. And, and indeed, uh, there are many people who have discussed this kind of correct to predict a model for learning in biological systems and, and uh, mammals. But you can see where the thermodynamics enters. Actuator does work on the world, work does work on the sensors, emulation and learning using feedback and measurement is necessarily dissipative and so on. Anyway, there are more details, in fact, probably too many details in this paper that I wrote with my colleague, Sally Shrapnel, uh, which you can find on the archive. I'll, I'll update it soon with, with some corrections. All right, so now let's just step back and see what all this means for or a causal agent. So certainly we could build that thing. Obviously it's a fairly minimal causal agent. It probably, it certainly is absolutely nothing like us. It's not alive, it doesn't reproduce, it doesn't eat. Uh, and in fact, it doesn't do much at all really. Uh, the models I've discussed in that paper I referred to, uh, the world is just a simple 
two-bit Boolean function of which there are 16 and the objective of the agent is to learn which of, it, of those it is. But let's look at what's going on here in a little bit more detail. So this is a summary of uh, results of a paper that we put on the, the PhilSci archive recently with uh, Peter Evans guiding us to write in a philosophical style. Uh, I'm not sure he was entirely su su successful, but he was happy enough for, for us to submit the paper. So the point is here, the agent knows the world only through the sensor and actuator records. That is all it's got. Um, and the correlations that the agent has access to are correlations between sensor and actuator records. These are actual physical states of physical devices, and they're the correlations it has to use. As I said, correlation is not causation. So where is the causal relation? Well, the causal relation will be represented in the physical states of the learning machine when the device has successfully captured the correct relation in the external world from interventions, because the actuator is intervening in the external world. So that might trouble some people uh, that in fact here, causal relations are indeed physical, but they're relations that determine correlations inside the agent. Now, of course, the agent would be unwise not to regard these as telling it something about the external world. Uh, that is the whole point. And in fact, that is why the device eventually learns because that's the best way for it to use its scarce resources in a thermodynamic sense in interacting with the world. But an agent with a different network of actuator sensor and learning machines might arrive at a completely different model after interacting with the very same physical device. In particular, in the quantum case, if the device is using photons, it'll get one picture of the world, but if the device is using coherent pulses, it'll get a completely different or possibly different picture of the world. So while all agents of a given type will learn the same causal relations modulo errors in their learning machines, there might be very, very different kinds of agents. So in this sense, this view of causation is perspectival. Let me come to the conclusions then. What I've said is that coupled clocks as dissipative limit cycles are very good for building neural networks in the way they handle noise. And in fact, it's sort of going back to what spike processing was originally intended to be for modeling actual neurons in the brain. I've tried to emphasize that there's a quantum regime at very low temperature where classical machine learning will fail. Without noise, it won't work. But quantum machine learning just continues happily on due to spontaneous emission and tunneling. But in the quantum case, measurement plays an absolutely crucial role for the kind of quantum clocks. You won't see a quantum clock unless you measure the right thing. So curiously, the act of measurement itself plays a critical role here. Um, now one could do, just being a bit speculative here, one could think about engineering reservoirs for novel kinds of emission and tunneling phenomenon to make really interesting kinds of limit cycles and quantum clocks. Howard Wiseman's been looking at that recently. And I also mentioned right at the end there that there are novel kinds of quantum learning agents via coherent feedback at very low temperature that don't require measurement, but are nonetheless irreversible and dissipative. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Gerard. Uh, if we can uh, show our applause in a Zoom-friendly way. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so if anyone has any questions, if they could put it in chat and then I will announce people in turn in a sort of civil fashion. Um, uh, first up, we have a question from Hans, uh, if, uh, if you want to speak up. Hi, hi, Gerard. Thank you very much for, you, for this very clear and instructive talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the basic setup of your learning agent, which you explained on a slide, I think it was 12 or 13. Um, when you discussed the, the learning curve and this, this uh, back propagation thing. And I was wondering, um, you know, referring to machine learning, there are these basic classes like uh, supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement learning. How would you classify this, this learning agent of what type is it and why? Okay, so the, 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 one, I'm, the, the one I've been talking about is a binary classifier that has to be trained. So oh, that's supervised um, learning then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, supervised learning, that's correct. Okay. Now, 
I haven't had a chance to look at other kinds, but. Um, and could you, but this is, you know, this is uh, then very much a, right. I mean, in the, as in the perception, you, you, you provide it with many examples and it should learn to classify correctly images, for example, into the, whether it's a sheep or, or, or whatever. That's, that's right. So that's the example I discussed in the emulator model that I tried to present at the end. Uh, it's, it's not really supervised learning there because it would be based on something more like a recurrent neural network. Um, it, it sort of yeah. learns on the fly. Exactly. That's what so, I was thinking because your, your learning model is, you know, the setup is more general and discussing causality yeah. and intervention. It's of course, it must be an entity that does something, you know, at its yeah. own decision, so to speak, uh, intervene on the world. Yeah. And, and, and in, in that sense, it should be, you know, uh, much broader and you should also be able to discuss, you know, oh, and reinforcement learning and things. Yeah, no, we've gone some way to doing that based on nested uh, emulators. So the, the, basically there's that simple emulator checking for trying to predict the sensor record and correcting if it's incorrect, but you can then have other, other sensors and actuators driving that lower level and so on and so on and so on. And uh, those devices begin to look, well, they're exactly like recurrent neural networks in fact, but I haven't gone through the physics in detail for each of those and you know, worked out protocols and written down the, the equations for it. Thank you, very interesting. Uh, next, we have a question from Klaus, I believe. Yes, uh, so great talk, really exciting. And you can imagine, I really enjoyed seeing how the measurement back action played a role in the, in the synchronization of your, of your collective emission. But of course, as you also know, with the quantum regression theorem, we can also calculate this kind of periodicities in a deterministic yeah. manner. So I think my, yeah. my question is, yeah. uh, could you imagine that we could actually replace all these measurements by an analysis of correlation functions where we don't have to adjust yes. the measurements? Yes, I, I think that's absolutely right. So uh, it'll all be down to time scales because to get correlation functions, you need some sort of averaging and sampling. Uh, but yes, in principle, you could. So. The, the, uh, the obvious way to show a limit cycle in the lab is to look at the, the Fourier transform of two-time correlation function and see peaks away from zero. Uh, but uh, it might be slow because of the averaging required to get the spectrum right. or, the or the correlation function. So what do you think it, it has as a consequence for the, for the actual role of measurement? Because the machine is actually saying choo-choo, <laughs> even when you're not listening, in some sense, because the, the regression theorem dictates that it has to say choo-choo. It's just you don't know the timing of the choose. Yes, that's right. Um, hmm, that's a good question. I'd have to think about that. So, so the question is, what is a quantum agent thinking when no one is listening? Yes. Hmm. Um, very strange question, <laughs> but something to think about. Okay, uh, next we have a question from uh, Barbara, I believe, or oh, two questions. Yes, in yes, yes. Yeah, thank you very much for this talk that I think touched on many very interesting topics. So I am the condensed metaphysicist here in the audience. So my first question is on the, on your distinction between causation in general and agency. So in condensed metaphysics, we always have these susceptibilities. So we apply a field or a pressure or whatever, and we get a response and we do it periodically in time. So then we have the real and imaginary part of the susceptibility. And mm -hmm. here we also need thermodynamics because you have to suppose that before applying the cause, the system is in equilibrium and ready to respond to the signal. So there also we need thermodynamics. So maybe, yeah, you, you first answer my first question before I ask the second one. So it, it, it somehow relates to uh, Klaus's question. You know, you could run uh, the system on a limit cycle and measure the two time correlation function and see how it changes as a, uh, as yeah. a function of the driving. Uh, so that would be more consistent with the sort of things one would do in condensed matter physics. Except here, it's a single system. I want to stress that it's not, it's not, you're not making collective measurements on a whole bunch of yeah. identical systems. Um, and there no doubt, but there, there will be regimes where this thing is well outside of linear response theory, where the noise is 
Yeah, highly, possibly. highly mm -hmm. more political uh, in general. And mm -hmm. so there's a much greater scope, I think, for learning uh, and causation defined this way. Now, of course, there's still, you know, the basic facts as physicists we know about causation, obviously propagation on the light cone and all the, all the rest of it. Um, and there's a question of how one, you know, time stamps these records. You, you act on the world and then a sensation comes back sometime later. It's not instantaneous or it may not come back at all. So there are all those sorts of issues in the background, which I haven't discussed. Yet. And my second question is, so Everything you told us has kind of a quantum version and the classical version. So your sensors, your actuators, and then your clock, your perceptron, or at least the um, mm -hmm. thing that makes the bifurcation, um, the oscillation. Yeah. So yeah. you are, I was somewhat confused about your goal. So your goal is to make everything as quantum as possible to understand how far you can go. Yes, well, th that's the sort of curious that they're sort of just very curious about what the quantum limits to these devices yes. are. But you might be asking, what's the point? Uh, why build a quantum learning machine? And I think there my hope is that these devices will be far more energy efficient than the current way in which we waste vast amounts of energy training deep neural networks. That's my hope. But also these foundational issues of uh, if you have agents that can learn, and function at extremely low temperatures due entirely to quantum processes. It makes you think about what sorts of physical agents there are out there in the universe, which for the most part is pretty cold. Um, that's a kind of wild speculation, but uh, I think it's an interesting speculation. Now, there's a really important question that I'd like to consider next based on multiple agents uh, interacting, multiple quantum agents interacting with a single quantum system or two quantum systems, because I think that provides a very physical way of thinking about bigness friend type arguments. And certainly that's something I'd like to do next. And the whole question of multiple agents is, is really critical to, 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 to address. How does an agent know it's interacting with a chunk of the world and not another agent? Uh, how do we prove that two agents interacting with the same bit of the world achieve the same causal relation. Um, I have some results on this, but much more work needs to be done. Thanks. So next we have a question from the unfortunately microphoneless Massimiliano. Um, he has asked, uh, could you extend this to generative learning models? <laughs> right, uh, now I'm out of my comfort zone when it comes to machine learning and uh, things like GANs, generative adversarial networks. Yeah, that would be really good. I'd love to do that. Then we could, you know, think about a quantum agent that would compose music or write text or something. Uh, but I see no reason why you couldn't, actually. After all, you know, the algorithm that is a, gen that is a GAN uh, could be simply modeling some other physical system and you could build the physical system. In, in fact, people do this. They're called neuromorphic networks uh, or neuromorphic computing devices. So yes, you could. Uh, at least some smart person with a better background in neural networks could think about how to do this in some physical system. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that has uh, satisfied Massimiliano. Uh, yes, it has. Um, okay, and good. finally, we have a question from T. Muller. Hi, right, it's Thomas. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was very inspiring. Um, I have a question on on your memory model. So um, could you say something about how you, you copy the information uh, that you get into your um, emulator? And maybe this links okay. to a more to a more broader issue of how your notion of a quantum agent relates to the notion of quantum agents we discussed at some length yesterday. So agent can let, let, let me take the first one first, because that's a lot easier, although it's difficult. So first of all, memories are not absolutely necessary. The learning machine itself could function on the fly, just taking data from the actuator and producing outputs from the sensor and doing comparisons on the fly. Uh, largely, I when I did this analysis in, in that long paper I mentioned on the archive, I introduced a memory just for ease of presentation. Now, 
uh, there are very easy ways to build memories out of uh, limit cycles. That's the basic idea of a hop fill net. So sort of recurrent hop fill nets can be used to implement uh, memories. And so the, the, the same kind of mathematics and physics involved in limit cycles could be used for the memories as well. Now your more difficult question of what this has got to do with agents that uh, Renato discussed yesterday. Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, in his sense of an agent, they're more like the sorts of things we use in quantum foundations where states prepared, processed and measured. Uh, there's no, at least I'm not aware of, any notion of learning going on there, or I guess, um, unless I've missed something, but it, I think that's the key difference. They're just actions and measurements rather than, or actions and sensations rather than learning. Whereas I'd like to stress that really learning is the absolute critical component in defining an agent. Thanks. Okay, I think uh, Hans has another question. Uh, if you want to. Uh, speak up. So I guess this is just a little add-on to the question that Thomas just asked, and Gerald, your 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 answer uh, regarding how to copy information into the memory, and then you refer to the limit cycle. But you know that that is classic. So you are talking about storing classical information about the outside world yes. in the agent, right? So in that sense, yes. you know, a quantum agent. You could, of course, consider also, you know, uh, developing a quantum memory about uh, oh, yes. its experience in dealing with the outside world. How would it? How would the answer be there? Absolutely. Or how? I, I, okay. So there, I would go to these uh, quantum coherent control protocols, which are entirely re irreversible, using yeah. circulators, but they don't use measurements anywhere. So it's basically cascaded systems theory from quantum optics. So there the, the sensors would have be acted upon from the external world, uh, say by pulses of light, then passed on through some network of, passed through a circulator to a network of optical cavities and nonlinearities, which could easily realize a memory or further processing without any measurement taking place. Um, so I think you could do it in the, I, I, I know you can do it in the context of coherent quantum control. Right, but in this is unique the quantum picture, of course. This is uniquely yeah. quantum. There's no classical yeah. of, of that. So the outside world would, you could treat that classically, but it would trigger a quantum input process inside. Yes. Right. That's right. Okay, so, so for this example, a, if you wanted to make collective classic. measurements on the, on the external world, you would just, keep passing the quantum information to the processor and store it in some memory and then do collective transformations upon it or something like, like that. Now, of course, the outside world could be quantum too. You know, if it's some quantum optical system, there's no reason why it might not be. So then you would have what you described at, at our meeting of a month or so ago as a, as a quantum quantum kind of agent. World is quantum and the agent is quantum for the most part. Thank you. Okay, and with that, uh, if we can uh, thank our speaker again. And um, yes, in 20 past wherever you happen to be, uh, we will have our next talk. So until then, um, take a break, or if you want to continue to chat here, certainly I won't stop you. Um, all right. Thanks again, Gerard, for your talk. Okay, no problem. I'll stick around in case anybody has further questions.